Hello and good evening to everyone. Welcome again on another Saturday, depending on where you are in the world, we'll determine the time. But I have the pleasure of speaking with Jennifer Smith, who is a PhD in microbiology, immunology, epidemiology, and we'll be speaking to her in just a minute. But I just wanted to quickly highlight that in the next few weeks, we're going to be trying to have one of our first LinkedIn Live conferences and that's where we pull together experts on different areas so i want you to look out for that because we will need you to join in for us to grow that uh, community so here we have jennifer with us all the way from hawaii how are you jennifer aloha dr mcmillan how are you today excellent that was really good <laughs> and so so tell us now i usually ask what's the weather like well, it's early morning here so far, um, so good. So I'm hoping for a nice sunny day as usual. Excellent, and it is 7 a.m. in Hawaii. That is a tremendous time difference, yes. but really appreciate that you've come on. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Jennifer. Well, who are you, what do you do? Um, well, I have a doctoral degree in microbiology and molecular cell sciences. A uh, majority of my career has been spent studying influenza viruses, both in um, small animal models and also studying um, different uh, human influenza viruses and ways that we can improve vaccines for influenza. I've had the opportunity to work with other respiratory viruses and also um, a bit of work on Ebola, so. <laughs> wow, so that's, that's really, really interesting. So where did that passion come from? Because I've got you as a passionate virologist. <laughs> where did that come from? You know, I've just always really been interested in reading about infectious diseases. And even before I went to college, I would read about the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, I loved reading about e Ebola virus and the, e and the virus hunters that would go look for where these viruses originate from. And um, when I went to college, I actually majored in microbiology. I was studying to be a medical doctor, but I really, really enjoyed being in the lab and working in the laboratory. So, you know, I prefer to work with my hands and the lab just seemed like a really great fit. Wow, that's wow. tremendous. So now when we think about the corona, because you've got a lot of experience with coronaviruses. So what were your first thoughts when you heard about the COVID pandemic starting in Wuhan, what were you thinking at that time? So my work, my doctoral work was actually with influenza virus and looking at how these viruses, um, the ecology of these viruses in the live markets in Southeast Asia. So from that time, you know, kind of keep an eye on things that were going on in Southeast Asia, because we know that this is like the epicenter for where viruses can um, can originate and emerge. We know that the markets are a good um, mixing vessel for all of these different viruses. When you bring different animals together and people, uh, this is where zoonotic viruses generally emerge. So I always keep an eye out on that area and, you know, anything that's new that's circulating there. Um, in fact, in 2002, we were looking at uh, high path avian viruses transmitting into the human population. So we had at the time we had collaborators there in Hong Kong. And when the when we started hearing about ill people, um, our collaborators went to the markets and got samples from poultry, but then they also went and got samples from the humans that were in the hospital. And unfortunately, the virus that we found was a coronavirus. So our collaborators were actually the first ones to discover the SARS coronavirus, the original one. Oh, that's, so, that's a 2003 uh, epidemic yeah. in, in China. Wow. So you guys first picked up on that coronavirus at that time. Wow. Right. That, that, yeah. Go on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So we were thinking that it was avian influenza that had jumped into humans again. So the viruses from the poultry was avian, high path avian flu, but the virus in the humans was the coronavirus. So... I always keep an eye out on that area, just kind of see what's going on. You know, we're always waiting for the next pandemic. We know it's not a matter of if, but when. So 
when I saw the first story, probably early January, end of December, early January 2020, about a mysterious pneumonia in Wuhan, I, I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I'm going to kind of keep an eye on this one and see what happens. You know, is this is this indeed avian influenza again? You know, we have these these periodic or episodic events where avian viruses are jumping into the human population. So flu is definitely trying to make its leap. Um, so I just kind of kept an eye on it and saw this starting to develop. And sure enough, it was, again, another coronavirus. Wow. So before we even go into any more details about these, these coronaviruses, I want you to help us to understand something that causes a lot of confusion, including for myself. Okay. When we're trying to identify these viruses and we're using PCR, mm -hmm. can you explain to us simply what this is and why it is important? Certainly. So PCR is a very powerful tool. Um, I know a lot of people are learning about it, which is really great. Um, it was invented by Carrie Mullis in the early to mid 80s. So it's really harnessing the power of DNA replication, right? So this is a natural biological process and we can use this to identify a gene of interest or amplify something to use to research. So it's very simple. Um, we're using synthetic pieces of DNA. So we make these short pieces of DNA that match our gene of interest or area of interest and harness the power again of DNA replication. So using DNA polymerase, we can amplify a specific region of DNA, which then becomes part of further reactions. So that's where you become a chain reaction. So with each cycle, you get a log ex exponential growth of your specimen. So if you start out with one gene copy, that becomes two, four, eight, and so on. So with each cycle, you're getting amplification of your specific gene of interest. So uh, explain to us then, because this is an RNA virus, so it's not yes. a DNA virus. So how does the PCR work for an RNA virus? Right. So the first step would be called reverse transcription. So what we do is we take the RNA and turn it into DNA and then use that for further reactions. Now, for, for the SARS-CoV-2, they're using a modification of PCR, which is called quantitative or real-time PCR. So the power of this is normally when you do a PCR test, in order to say, is, your, is what you're looking for there or not, you have to run it on a gel. So you have to visualize it some way. Now, using real-time PCR, is fantastic because now we use technology and you can watch on a computer screen each round of replication and you can see that you can watch as each cycle goes and so it's visualizing it in real time and you can see if that actually is being detected or not so, so this uses so sorry this uses a Usually the primers or synthetic oligonucleotides have a probe on them. So it fluoresces when a laser hits it. So this machine is using that. And when the laser hits it and it fluoresces, then it shows as a blip on your graph. Okay. So I, I have heard lots of comments that we have not been able to identify the virus because the PCR doesn't identify the virus that kind of of thing where does that fit in is that does that make any sense what are people talking about when they, they they speak about those things right so the the main issue is that pcr while it can detect genes or genetic material it cannot tell us anything beyond that so we don't know whether the virus is actively replicating so is this just a bit of genetic material that we've discovered or is this a live app actually replicating virus. Now, with quantitative PCR, we know that it's, it's quantitative. So it relates to an amount of something. So it's inverse, each cycle is inversely proportional to an amount. In this case would be like amount of virus or a number of gene copies. So the higher the number or the longer it takes to detect that piece of genetic information means that there's very little 
or the less there is in your starting material, right? So normally when we design or develop PCR assays, we run them for about 20 to 35 cycles. When you start to reach the end, so when you start to get up to your end of cycles, if you still haven't detected anything, then we know there's nothing in the starting material. Now there's some interesting things that can happen with PCR. So as each cycle, as each cycle happens, you start to lose up, use up some of the um, reagents that are in your reaction, right? Now, primers are very promiscuous, <laughs> okay? They really want to stick to something. So if we get up in the higher cycle range and they cannot find your gene of interest, they're just going to start sticking to each other. So we call this primer dimers. Now, once they stick to each other, they can set off that beacon and it will look like you've detected something. So we know that anything over like 30 cycles is negligible. Could be primer dimers, could be environmental contaminant. Now for SARS-CoV-2, the crux of the matter is they're running these tests at 45 cycles. When I first heard that the cutoff value for these, for these tests was 40, that set off alarm bells in my head because I thought, if you're going to say anything up to 40 cycles out of 45 is going to be considered positive, you might as well call everybody positive. Mm. So <laughs> that, that's an important point. But if you're doing large numbers of samples, what you're saying is that it increases the numbers of false positives that you get. Yes, correct. So it, will it accurately, therefore, identify the positives? Yes. So mm -hmm. PCR but you can't is very tell what percentage. Right. PCR is very sensitive and very specific. Now, what we do normally when you develop this assay is you want to do standard control. So in this case, I would say you would determine the titer of your virus you would make dilutions of that virus and you would run that at the same time as you run your unknown samples. So then you can compare your unknown sample to those dilutions to determine is there indeed virus there and if so, how much. So this should really be done with every single, every single time you're running this assay. So let me just pull something here. So you are saying that in effect, what we are doing in our current general strategies, we are just looking for a piece of, of RNA, mm -hmm. but we don't know if that is live active virus or if that is just for whatever reason, a part of the right virus that happens to be there. Is that right. why we can sometimes see uh, a long positive result on a patient who clearly has recovered? Is, it, is that the kind of thing that it will cause confusion with? So it also has to do with how the virus replicates. So this is the largest RNA virus um, that we know of coronaviruses. So they have a single strand of RNA, but it's really big. So how they replicate is they make what's called subgenomic messages. So they make from this long strand, they'll make shorter pieces. So what could be happening is these subgenomic messages kind of stick around even after the virus is no longer there. So we could be just detecting those as the body is shedding um, whatever's left. Mm. And so from a, from a practical point of view, how is that? Why, why is that so important in the context of the pandemic? I mean, if we're getting positives for people who are symptomatic, even I guess it's, it matters when we're looking at people who don't have symptoms. Mm -hmm. That's where it becomes problematic. Is that about right? Yes. Yes. So. There's been a lot of studies that have come out now, some publications that show very clearly that if they're, if they're detecting anything with CT values greater than 30, that they cannot isolate any live virus. So you usually take your sample and put it on cells and see if anything comes up. So there's a lot of studies that have come out now showing that correlation. So we know that if anything's over 30, it's most likely this person is no longer infectious or contagious. And we should really, really be using those numbers 
when determining um, what kind of mitigation efforts we're going to be using. So, so one of the arguments that has been made is that the criteria has been changed recently. So from 40 cycles, which is what it was being used, to 28 cycles by the CDC. So in effect, the CDC is correct with regards to using a smaller cycle to identify positives related to vaccination. Is that about true? Right. So what they did was they said, they would like to sequence these isolates, right? So we want to look at the whole genome sequence, see if there's any changes, um, mutations in these viruses. Um, now we know that they cannot sequence whole genome unless the CT values are 28 or less. So now that tells us clearly, if you cannot sequence anything fully, then it's not a live actively replicating virus because you need that entire genome to make more virus. Mm -hmm. So this is, so where we are now, so I guess part of the issue is that there was um, quite a bit of argument as to the numbers being overcounted with regards to the amount of people who had um, um, infection. I would say from a clinical perspective, um, we are usually concerned about the false negatives where people have symptoms yes. and simply because the test is negative, but the clinical picture fits, people don't get treated. That's usually in my mind, more of a concern. But yes, I can understand from a population perspective that if we're identifying large numbers of people who are positive children and so on, that if the cycles are too high, that's probably going to be relatively inaccurate. One yes. question was asked here that I think is, is an interesting one, is when we test for the PCR for a coronavirus or the COVID, can we differentiate between other coronaviruses that are floating around that, may, that can cause a cold or something? Yes. So in these assays, uh, that's a very good point. So in these assays, they're using three targets. So two of the three targets should be virus specific. Now, one, when the CDC, CDC kit, the third target is, uh, I believe, just RNA polymerase. So you use a target that will be like an internal control. So this tells us, is there an RNA there and is it human? So that's important. Um, it's basically a quality control for your sample. Then the two targets being used should be virus specific. Now in a lot of these assays, I found it very interesting. They're using one of the genes that basically just tells us that it's a, a coronavirus. So um, this can be problematic. So if you have a specimen, technically all three targets should be detected for you to say that it's positive. Now, most importantly, the virus specific targets should be detected for you to be able to say it's positive. I have seen cases where only the internal control or quality control is positive and they're still calling these people as cases of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what this person is saying, yes. Yes, that is problematic. I've also seen instances where only the gene that is um, the general gene for coronavirus is detected and they're being called cases of COVID. So, you know, these, these test kits as well as everything else is only emergency use approved. They are not fully validated. If you read some of the instructions for use, they will tell you whether or not they've been tested or validated using common human coronaviruses or not. And in a lot of cases, they have not. Okay, so uh, uh, from, from my perspective at least, um, I understand some of those points and I can see some of the errors based on what you've been saying, even with what we have been, been looking at, but is it actually relevant? Because for certain we have a pandemic, because that's one yes. of the problems that people keep on saying there is no pandemic. And I'm <laughs> saying just because there are some errors doesn't mean there isn't a pandemic. There is a pandemic, but maybe the numbers have been overcounted. But as far as I can see from a clinical perspective, what you can't overcount is people who get sick and come into hospital. And yes. that's clearly what has been happening in this pandemic. So here is the interesting question that I want to take us on to. Why is this coronavirus 
different because you've been dealing with all kinds of coronaviruses for years. What is going on with this one that makes it unusual, similar to the SARS-CoV in 2003? Well, looking at the genetics of this virus compared to SARS, I mean, I believe this is SARS reemerged. So this is SARS. Um, that's why they called it SARS, <laughs> mm -hmm. because it is really the same virus. It, it just has some mutations that make it a little bit different than the original one. Mm -hmm. And so in that context, then this virus, because you've seen the, the animal coronaviruses, because you had mentioned your chicken coronavirus, mm -hmm. that is, is a relatively benign virus, isn't it? And most coronaviruses only cause a cold. That is actually not true. So coronaviruses can cause people to get pneumonia and be hospitalized. So it is not out of the ordinary to see people severely ill with common human coronaviruses. But they usually have to be immune suppressed. Not necessarily. Mm, I think it's similar, you know, as we age, you know, we are more susceptible to different things and um, more severe illness for sure. Okay, and um, one of the questions that keeps on coming up, and I don't particularly want to get into it, but I'll, I'll mention some of the points. People are talking about gain of function. Is this more of a bioweapon? Does, based on your experience with coronaviruses, this one is not that much different from anything that we've had before. It's just, it's just a little bit more virulent. Is, is that about accurate? So I think what makes viruses more more um, problematic is their ability to to replicate in and transmit in a new host, right? So the thing about this virus, I think that's making it more um, problematic than the original SARS is that it binds the host receptor so tightly. So it's lock and key. This, this receptor ACE2 in humans and it, it just finds it so completely well that it makes it easier for the virus. It makes it very easy for the virus to get in, to replicate and to transmit. Yeah, so this now comes right into the area that I have an interest in. And so I want to explore this some, um, some more. So I have said that because the virus binds ACE2 and gets into the cell so tightly, I have been asking this question, which I don't know why it keeps getting missed by the scientific community, is what happens with serum ACE2? And the, the, just to clarify for people, serum ACE2 is that instead of the, the ACE receptor being attached to the cell, the body has clipped it off, it's floating in the bloodstream. Does this, if this binds to the virus, it, any thoughts about what could happen? So this is a very interesting question, and I actually hadn't thought about soluble ACE2 um, before stumbling upon your paper. So what that would suggest is that the virus is being bound to these soluble ACE2 in the bloodstream, forming these antigen antibody complexes. So we know that antigen antibody complexes can cause things like arthritis, right? And you can deposit into joints and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, this brings up a very interesting aspect that I hadn't considered before. I, I, I think that part of the reason I am so interested in this is because I can see based on the fact that, say for instance, I've always said that children, not even children, infants who are generally in, in, immunosuppressed don't get severe disease. So it suggests that the viral infection of itself is not that severe. But for some reason, in some people, it almost triggers like an allergic or immune or autoimmune response that causes really, really severe disease. And this is what then goes on to kill people. And so in that context, if this is happening, where do we go with this coronavirus? Because if, if there are lots of mutations, will we ever get on top of it? Well, hopefully, um, as a virus jumps into a new host and starts to interact more with the host, in general, the virus should become more attenuated. So this is this is what I kind of the analogy I love to use. Um, 
a virus's whole goal in life. So if we think about from the viral point of view, all I want to do is make more of myself. That's the whole goal of a virus. So if a virus invades a new host, it wants to be able to make more of itself and spread to another host and another host and another host as many as possible just to make as much of it as it can. So if we think of viruses like Ebola, Ebola kills the host very quickly. So it doesn't have a, a very good opportunity to, to transfer itself to a lot more hosts, right? This virus has learned and adapted very well to make more of itself and to transmit efficiently to spread to as many new hosts as possible. So the goal is to find this balance, right? We want to we want to make more of ourselves, but we want to keep our hosts alive so that we can make more and transmit and keep the chain going. So the thought would be that this virus could continue to be endemic, but it could become more attenuated. So we could learn to live with each other, basically. Mm, that's a very, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good point. Now, one of the things that I have been concerned about is that because we've been so focused on finding therapies for um, getting out of the pandemic, we haven't done our homework correctly. And one of the big issues is about this principle of mucosal immunity. Um, I, I don't know how to explain, but the, the mucosa, the, the nose, the, the, the airways, the throat, has an, an, an immune system on its own that usually protects against most viruses. Are we benefiting by trying to bypass this mucosal immunity? So that's a very good point. Um, so, you know, people talk about how these therapeutics and vaccines were rushed. So from my perspective and why it takes so long to generate effective preventive measures is because we need to understand the virus. So we need to learn and study how the virus is interacting with the host. We need to learn the pathology of the virus, what is happening, how the host immune response is responding, how that's being programmed. Once we have a good understanding of how the host immune response is being programmed, we can then use that information to choose the appropriate therapeutics and make vaccines and preventatives that will actually be more effective. So the question that I've been asking, and I don't, I have not seen in the literature, maybe somebody can share if they have, is what is the correlates of protection? Now, what does this mean? For something to be effective, the, the goal, the golden, you know, the golden ring would be to prevent infection, to, to do something that will just stop the virus from infecting and not causing harm. So correlates of protection would be what part of the immune system or what level of immune response is required in order to provide this sterilizing immunity to prevent infection. We don't know. We don't know, if, is it antibody? If so, what level of antibody? What type of antibody? You bring up a very good point about mucosal immunity. If we stop the infection here in the nose before it can get down in the lungs, then most certainly we can prevent severe infection because once it gets down in the lungs, that's where all the trouble starts. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, this is where I think that we have an issue with regards to where we are. So when people talk about us getting out of the woods, I'm saying that um, actually based on how this virus operates, and there's a unique thing about this virus versus I think the other normal corona or cold viruses, and that is that your body doesn't know it's there. It evades interferon detection until it gets down into your lungs. And that ability is what makes it so transmissible. So therefore it can be transmitting, meaning that it can be passing on viral particles to people even before 
you've got symptoms. That's like the perfect virus. It's 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 you can't ask for any better as a virus to to spread even before somebody knows that they have got it. That that that's like the the king of virus, so to speak. Yes, that's very sneaky. <laughs> it is very sneaky. That's not how the flu virus works, is it? That one usually causes some symptoms quite uh, even while it's it's being transmitted. So you know you've got it. Yes, generally flu is most infectious the first two days after onset of symptoms. My understanding is they're saying this virus is most transmittable the two days prior to symptom onset. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that fits with the with the research that the body doesn't detect the virus, so it doesn't mount an interferon response. And so therefore the virus is spreading to the lungs and it's spreading outside of the body to other people whilst you're feeling completely fine. And so it even means that when you start having symptoms, this is why they do the contact tracing, it, you've spread it before you know. Mm -hmm. Right, correct. So it's already too late. Mm -hmm. It's already too late. And it, it, this is probably one of the reasons why many of the therapeutics that work as, say, antivirals, by the time they have gotten on board, the virus has already bolted the system. It, it, you can't catch it anymore. It's way ahead of you. And this is yes. what makes it so, so difficult. And a lot of people compare it to the flu. How, how is it different? from the influenza virus? So again, um, we talked about transmission and that period of transmission. This virus is more of a lower respiratory tract infection versus an upper respiratory tract infection, which is mostly what we see with influenza. Mm. So influenza is more of the upper airways that can sometimes yes. get into the lungs. Uh -huh. Coronavirus, this one, SARS, um, um, the, the COVID-19, is more of a, a lung infection that starts in the upper airway. That's a really, really good way um, of, of putting it. So where are we now based on your experience with virology? It, uh, is it time for people to start relaxing, putting their feet up? Oh, we have beat this. This is this is great. No problem. Do we listen to how the politicians put it across, or do we still have a way to go? So I think there's a couple things that are concerning to me. Now we circle back around to the testing situation. Um, from my perspective, all of this testing, we've created a, basically a testing pandemic. So testing everybody for everything. Um, what we, we've only done is muddied the waters. We have muddied the waters so we do not have a clear clinical picture of what COVID actually is. And as I said before, testing positive does not mean somebody is contagious. So we really don't have an understanding, and I'm sure as a clinician you can um, appreciate this, is what is COVID? COVID is supposedly the disease. Now, in my opinion, in order to have disease, you have to have symptoms. So, you know, the testing has been very problematic. And when you base all of what we've been doing on this testing without understanding it, um, it's just a house of cards. Um, here's, a, here's a question that has come up that I, I think that um, I want to try and see if I can answer because I think that the, there's an important point with this. Yes. The, um, the point about uh, COPD and people who have underlying lung disease is that what causes people to die is actually the little clots in the lung called microthrombi. It's not the inflammation in the lung. It's actually the little clots in the lung that block off the blood vessels. Now, a good example is that somebody who has COPD and are uh, short of breath at rest, they have about 75% of their lung capacity lost. So they've only got 25 left. By the time they've got about 20% left, they are on oxygen. So then they have such a small amount of lung that it doesn't take a lot of inflammation or even thrombosis to then make them go over the edge where you can't ventilate them. And this is primarily why I think so many people with underlying lung disease are at risk if they get severe COVID. But as you said, that's only if they get the symptoms associated with COVID, not if they're, they're positive for the virus. Um, 
uh, oh dear, uh, here's uh, one thought. Um, the gargle um, with, and with uh, poverty and iodine to stop the spread in some studies. It, it, any idea that anything like this works against any of these viruses? So the question that I have that um, people really haven't been able to provide an answer is, if someone does not have respiratory symptoms, how are they spreading a respiratory virus? Again, it's key to understand pathology and the mechanisms that are at play here in order to provide effective therapeutics and preventives. So, you know, I worked with bioaerosols. We used to aerosolize flu viruses, look at what particle size, where is the virus? Um, can we isolate live virus? So there are shearing factors that are involved. Um, there's a lot of work out there with bioaerosols and looking at that. So it all has, there's a lot of factors that come into play, right? There are environmental factors. So we know that pH and temperature um, affect particle size and transmission of virus via aerosol. There are human factors. So my respiratory rate, my inspiration rate, there are a lot of different things that come into play that aren't being discussed. So it's really hard to make a comment as far as like therapeutics when we don't really have a good understanding of the pathology. Yeah, that's a very good point. Can I, can I clarify something? You mentioned something about influenza, um, uh, mucosal or nasal influenza vaccines that had been developed. What was the difficulty with them why they didn't become mainstream right so this is a very good question and it's a lot of the work that i did when i was at the university of georgia so again as i mentioned we were doing aerosol studies so nebulizing virus now you know people may be familiar with the metamune intranasal influ influenza vaccine um, which was delivered via syringe into the nostrils so the problem there is this vaccine was supposed to be delivered as small droplet um, vaccine. So this can vary based on who the vaccinator is. So who's doing the delivery, you know, how fast they're pushing that plunger. This can create large droplets. And a lot of what was happening is then this so-called vaccine was dripping out of the nose also getting back into the throat and being swallowed. So that's why it is a good vaccine. Live attenuated vaccines work. And again, as you said, stimulate mucosal immunity, but the problem was the delivery method. So we were looking at, can we nebulize this live attenuated virus into the nares and get it back up into the nasal terminates where it could deposit and, and produce an effective mucosal immune response? because that's where you want to stop the virus is again, right where it enters. Absolutely. So it, it's purely about logistics in terms of being able to get the particles small enough that they can get into the mucosa and then right. trigger the immune system. Wow. And yes, and you want it to be consistent delivery at, across the board. So each person, it would be consistently delivered and they would all get the same effective dose. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on this question? Uh, predisposition for, I guess, not, not the infection, but the severe, um, the severe disease. Yes. Yeah, so this is a good point. So when, when I first heard about SARS and the coronavirus, you know, we know that the receptor is ACE2. We know that um, ACE2, there's differential expression based on age and gender. Um, so this goes to the point um, early on, I was intrigued why children weren't really getting infected or getting severe disease. Well, we know that the young do not have high levels of expression of ACE2, and that expression level increases as we age. We also know that men have higher levels of ACE2 than women. So there could be predisposition there just based on that um, differential expression of the receptor. Now, there are also different isoforms of ACE2. And as you mentioned, the soluble ACE2. So in these underlying medical conditions like hypertension, diabetes, that sort of thing, they may have more circulating or soluble ACE2 as well. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and that's certainly where I think that most of the risk comes from. As I, I recently pointed out to somebody is that normally obesity is not a risk factor for, say, flu. It doesn't increase your risk for a viral infection. But in the context still of COVID-19, it is absolutely a risk factor for severe disease. So these are the things, and obesity is associated with higher levels of soluble um, ACE2 as well. Um, uh, somebody made a point here about um, the caveats of the PCR tests and the false positives. You know, there is still evidence that there is undercounting of cases across the globe, which probably has some degree of truth to it. Of course. Yeah. I mean, not everybody, look, not everybody goes to the doctor. Not everybody gets severe illness. I mean, I was sick back last year, end of February, early March, and I'm not one to run to a doctor, you know, so, so at that time it wouldn't have mattered anyway. So here's the thing that was interesting to me at the beginning, you know, um, we would get calls from clinicians just like, oh, we want to test, we want to test, we want to test. And I was like, the only reason we normally test for flu is because there's a therapeutic. So there is a drug that's approved for use to treat influenza. Now, most of the time, traditionally, when you go to the doctor with a cold, they don't do any tests. If you have a cold, go home, get some rest, you'll be fine. So testing doesn't really inform treatment of the patient. So I found it very interesting, you know, early on when people were asking about all this testing. And later on, when people, when the serology test came out, people want to get tested, oh, did I indeed have it or not? And the only thing I could ask them was, would it change anything for you to know if you did? You know, you, you, were, you were mildly ill, you recovered, you know, is there really an impact? So is it really important to know every single person who has been infected? What, what would be the value in that? Mm, a good question, good point. Here's, a, here's another question here, is that um, what could be a strategy to prevent future pandemics from coronaviruses? Because we're likely to have more, I assume. Yes. Um, I don't really want to get into politics. I'm not a politician. Um, I think the key is, you know, like I said, this is SARS and this is SARS reemerge. So this virus came out in 2002, end of 2002, early 2003. And scientists have been studying that virus since then. So I, a colleague that I worked with at University of Georgia when I was there was working with SARS and studying SARS and um, therapeutics against SARS. So I think the key is, you know, sometimes we forget um, there are very important lessons that we can learn, even if, you know, SARS original kind of disappeared the way it, it, it emerged um, mysteriously. But studying that and continuing to study that and develop therapeutics and have an understanding how the virus works is very important. So supporting that kind of research and funding that kind of research, even if that virus may not be around and circulating, is still very, very valuable. Mm. Um wouldn't knowing if one had the virus inform the need for vaccination um I, I probably would say that if you if you've got the infection it probably is a little too late in the sense of getting vaccinated um but it does raise one of the big questions that i don't know if there is there's clarity on which is about the if somebody has previously been infected, are they more protected as opposed to being vaccinated? But again, that has a lot of controversy associated with it. But I look at reinfection rates and reinfection rates among people who have had the diseases is relatively low. Um, I'd like to add to that actually. So we know that natural active acquired immunity always is better than passive immunity. So if you get an infection, you know that your body, look, your body is made for this, made to develop memory immune responses. And so nothing really is better than that. So, you know, having had the actual infection, I'm sure that you actually have a very good immunity. Again, it goes back to the point of correlates of protection and what actually is protecting. Is it antibodies? Is it T cells? What level? Um, we know, again, if we look back at our studies with SARS original, we know that um, antibodies uh, immunity lasted for up to six years. 
We know with MERS, another coronavirus, neutralizing antibodies were present for up to three years. So there is, again, by studying the past, we can inform um, possibly how this virus, it's a coronavirus. It's working like all other coronaviruses. That's why it's classified in this class. So we can use that information from those to inform um, what we're doing now. I also question vaccinating people who've already had it because of something called antibody dependent enhancement. So something intriguing that I discovered was that you know, if we look at the people who are getting severe disease, it's those who are 60 years and older. We know that 90% of adults 50 and older have immunity to all common human coronaviruses. So the question that I have is this severe infection we're seeing in the elderly population possibly due to pre-existing immunity? And that hasn't really been explored. What we do see is those who have had the disease, the actual COVID disease that are getting infected are three times more likely to develop a severe adverse effect. Is again, is this due to pre-existing immunity? I think this is very important to look at. Mm. Yeah, so that is, that is some really, really important points. And as we come to the close here now, Jennifer, there is the thing that I have always said is that I think we are underestimating the pandemic. And I think that we probably need to apply more research into how this disease is affecting people and understanding it. I don't think it's good enough that we don't know, that we don't understand why we're using steroids. We don't know. These are really, really important questions. And the more we understand about the disease, the more we understand about how the virus interacts with the body, the better prepared we will be for the future. So mm -hmm. yes. we can do more, have a more targeted approach. I agree. Absolutely. And so I want to thank you again, Jennifer. You can't see all the comments. There's so many comments here that um, we can't necessarily get into at the moment. Um, but I want to thank you so much for giving your expertise, especially with regards to clarifying about PCR. I think that's something that has caused a lot of confusion for people um, everywhere, including myself. So I'm really, really appreciative of that as well. Uh, we need to hear more experts like yourselves giving us an unbiased, clear, honest, um, practical, scientific solutions and thoughts on what is happening. So um, thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Um, and we hope to bring some more speakers in the near future. We are always looking for interesting things to talk about. And so look out for us um, and look out for the upcoming conference when we pull a lot of people together to di discuss specific issues. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Philip.